So the New York Times article was published May 19th, and as you saw, the headline is Russia is trying to wipe out Crimea's Tatars. In it, I detail what is happening now since um, this year, really, this happening on the peninsula. In it, I talk about how on April 26, Russia officially banned the Crimean Tatar Majlis, which is the Crimean Tatar's legislative body. On May 12th, they conducted an a number of raids and searches of Crimean Tatar homes and arrested several indi- individuals, including Ilmi Umaro, who was the deputy head of the Crimean Tatar Majlis. Um, and they're charging him now. They've officially charged him, and he's going to, to have to face trial in theory for violating Russia's territorial integrity. Just recently, well, not recently, but this past several years since 2014 annexation, the past two years, the Crimean Tatars have been facing numerous oppressions, Raids on mosques, raids on homes, um, activists have mysteriously disappeared or been found dead. So really, they're really struggling right now under Russian occupation, and we really need to alert the world about what's happening there and what they can do to change the situation. And he seems, I don't know his age, but from the pictures that the Majlis is, is, is showing to me, the media, he seems quite young, probably in his 20s, early 20s, or late 20s, and it's quite a devastating story. He disappeared on May 25th. His parents don't know where he is. According to the Majlis statement that they released, there's CCTV footage of him being um, taken by some sort of policeman-looking people, um, and yet nobody has any idea, according to the Majlis statement, that Russia or the local um, police force won't register it as a case of a missing person. So they're not doing anything to try to help and find who he, um, where he might be. So again, this is just another example of Crimean Tatar activists, anyone who might have any inkling against the Russian occupation. They're being abducted, they're being arrested, and nobody knows what's really happening to them. And according to the Majlis, since 2014, there have been two dozen cases of these kinds of abductions by Russian security forces. Again, the Crimean Tatar Majlis just had an article. Um, I just posted it to my Facebook page recently. I, International um, Committee for Crimea just posted it, and they gave a, um, a whole list of the people who have mysteriously disappeared on the peninsula and who are of Crimean Tatar descent. So I encourage readers and viewers to read that. You know, I think the Crimean Tatars are using all the resources they can right now, and one of their big things is to get Mustafa Jumilov and other Crimean Tatar leaders like Rafat Shabar to meet with these delegates and these heads of states and to meet with international media. And that's really one of the top ways they are doing to raise awareness. We also had the Eurovision Song Contest, and Jamala, who was of Crimean Tatar descent, she won, and I think that helped to raise awareness. Um, and obviously people who are not Crimean Tatar, such as myself, are doing all they can through op-eds, you know, in publications or through my documentary film. Um, whether it's having an impact, I can only pray and hope that it is. I hope someone important, maybe President Obama, read my op-ed and is willing to make those changes to the sanctions and also to push e- the EU to maintain their sanctions against Russia. Um, I think the only problem is there's so much tragedy happening in the world in general that you get that kind of fatigue, right? And so... People might assume, oh, the Crimean Tatars, they're just another poor group of people like the Syrians um, who are suffering and we don't have enough time or emotional or mental energy to pay attention. So, but I think people are being raised, are getting their, um, you know, awareness is being raised. Every time I screen my film, I get people come up to me that tell me they have no idea and then they feel really invigorated to try to do more and to raise awareness about the situation. Recently in D.C., I'm now part of a working group that's based in D.C., New York, but it's a working group that's going to try, um, that brings together different community leaders in America to raise more awareness about the Crimean Tatars. And it's founded by a man named Walter Ruby, who I can put you in touch with. Um, He does a lot of Jewish-Muslim relations works, like, um, yeah, trying to create collaborations between Jewish and Muslim people, and now he's formed this working group. And again, it's to bring awareness to the situation and to make sure, to show where we can all collaborate together. Well, the executive sanctions that President Obama signed um, when the Russian invasion occurred, so, and that's listed in the op-ed, um, he can update those to cite the Crimean Tatars in terms of what Russia's human rights violations against them. So I think that is the first step our leaders need to do, is to update those executive orders to cite the human rights abuses against the Crimean Tatars. This is another way to apply pressure on Russia to show them that we are holding them accountable for how they're treating this indigenous population in the peninsula. Um, in addition, there's Ukraine Stand for Ukraine bill, which was introduced in Congress in April, um, which further reaffirms... Um, that America is never going to recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea. And it also forces the president, basically, to certify to Congress that 
you know, either Crimea has been returned or that something has been worked out with Ukraine to Ukraine's um, uh, acceptance of the situation. So Ukraine to Ukraine's liking of the situation. So only once he's able to certify to Congress that the Crimea situation has been resolved to Ukraine's satisfaction, then he can lift sanctions. Otherwise, he can't lift. He or she can't lift sanctions before them. So I think that's really important to get that bill passed. Um, in addition, Andriy Dobryansky, which I'm sure I'm sure you know him. He's been doing a lot of lobbying work, and I know there's other sanctions that um, the president has not yet taken advantage of that would allow him to that would allow President Obama to apply further sanctions against specific groups of people. And Andre can tell you more about that. Congress approved those already, so now it's just up to the president to take advantage of them at this point. The film is doing very, very well. I'm very happy to say that. It's, it's been doing the fest- festival circuit. So it premiered at the Al Jazeera International Documentary Film Festival back in November. Um, since then, it's shown at the D.C. Independent Film Festival, where it won Best International Film. And then it recently screened at the Poppy Jasper International Film Festival, where it also won Best Documentary Film. So that's great. And it's done several other festivals, including um, the Rainier Film Festival in Washington State. Um, So I can't think of them all, but they're on my website if you want to look. And also, um, it's been doing doing a circuit around professional venues in the U.S. and in the European Union. So in in Europe, I screened at the European Parliament in Brussels. And that was a great event, and it was organized by several delegates of the parliament. So I, I think that was really um, one of the highlights of the, of the screening circuit. Um, in addition, for the deportation anniversary of the Crimean Tatars, May 18th, it just happened, um, the Ukrainian foreign ministry contacted me, and they ended up using my film and sending it to all their embassies. Um, and several of the embassies took up the offer to screen it in their respective communities. So I'm very happy about that, that the embassy, the Ukrainian guard, foreign, foreign ministry is now trying to use my film. Um, in addition, this film just screened at the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul. Um, in America, yes, I've been doing this kind of mini tour with it um, to various venues. Yesterday morning, we were at the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. I also went to the U.S. Ukraine Foundation before the Chicago Ukrainian Museum, the Minnesota Ukrainian um, Events Center. Um, it's coming up in Cleveland, Ohio next on June 3rd and 4th. And again, everywhere I'm going, it's being really well received. I get a lot of Ukrainians who never knew anything about the Crimean Tatars, who never learned their history, just like I had never learned their history in Ukrainian school. Um, and now they feel, like I said, they feel really invigorated to learn more, to take my film and to show it to their students, to their children, to their respective communities, and to really help fight and realize the Crimean Tatar cause is also part of, you know, Ukrainian um, self-determination, um, that the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Tatars are integral to our history, and that together um, we are going to be the ones who are standing against Russian occupation or Russian human rights violations, and you can't do that without the Crimean Tatars on board as well. You know, I'd love to do a follow-up now and to see what's happening now in the peninsula um, in 2016 and also with the Crimean Tatars who have had to flee. The Ukrainian foreign ministry puts it at about 20,000 Crimean Tatars have fled Crimea into Ukraine. So I'd like to do a follow-up about how they are adjusting as IGPs and what the situation is like for them in Kiev and Lviv. Um, so that I would love to have included. Um, in terms of some of the previous information, historical information, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy with how the story plays out. I think 44 minutes is long enough. Um, <laughs> you know, much longer, I don't know. Um, I mean, people would have found it interesting, but I think keeping it short and sweet is always better. There is information about, um, you know, about Ismail Gasparelli or Ismail Gasprinsky, who was um, in the 1800s. He was a leading Crimean Tatar intellectual, and he really revitalized the community. Um, he was one of the big leaders of, like, instituting gender equality, um, modernism, you know, in Crimean Tatar society. And so people really revere him. He's kind of like their Shevchenko, okay, like their Tadas Shevchenko in some respects. So I would lo- have loved to include so much more about him, but there's just not enough time. And, you know, also historical footage of him that I don't have, I just wouldn't have visually made sense at that point. Well, please follow my website, a strugglefornhome.com. I list every upcoming screening. I do have a distributor, um, and she, Al Jazeera, has purchased 
the rights to the film, so they will air it eventually. I'm not sure when that's going to happen. And she's working with other um, news organizations and media organizations in Europe and the U.S. to get this film further distributed, which is great. So I hope that happens. But right now, the best way is to pay attention to the website and see where I'm screening. People can always email me. So if they would like to see the film or organize a screening in their communities, they should email me. Um, and that's the best way. So just get in touch with me, and um, people can write me at info at a struggle for home dot com. I don't remember the email address. Info at a struggle for home dot com. There are um, media sources that I read, read frequently, and I think a lot of actual Crimean Tatars read to get what's hap- to get the real news about what's happening in the peninsula. Whether they're still in the peninsula and they're just not getting you know proper information from local sources, or whether they live abroad now. So some of the um, Media that people read include um, Q, it's QNA, I think it's I think that's the UK, or QHA sorry um, you know the UK sort of like in the English you kind of forget which letters they're using um, but that's a great source like the Crimean News Agency which I believe was actually shut down by Russia because it's a Crimean Tatar focused so that's a great organization Euromaidan Press gives a lot of information ATR is operating from Ukraine now but they still um, keep up on what's happening locally. Radio Free Europe, um, Radio Liberty, that is a great source, and that's all in English as well. And, you know, um, it's not being translated necessarily. It's, it's written first in English in a lot of the articles they read. So you're not losing stuff in translation. So that's another great source people can use to find out what's really happening in the peninsula. So and the other way I find out a lot of my information is that I keep in touch with a lot of my contacts in Crimea, um, so they're constantly posting on Facebook about what's happening. All the latest abduction news or murder news, I get straight from them. And they have videos they post on YouTube as well, like actual handheld footage of the raids happening. So really it's about just kind of making those connections in Crimea to stay on top of things. But those news sources I listed, that is the best way to find out like what's really happening.